I am going to switch gears a little bit in terms of methods uh, to talk about our um, community-based uh, trials and with a focus on um, how they inform pragmatic trials because I think that's sort of a buzzword and there's, there's a lot of people that are very interested in moving that forward. Um, community-based participatory research and sort of commu what I like to call community-engaged research is really uh, pretty well established. Uh, it's not a new thing the way pragmatic clinical trials are. And I think there are some interesting lessons that can be taken from uh, these types of trials. One of the frustrating things that we have in, in medicine and in research is that there are different communities. So the people who conduct community-based trials are very unlikely to interface with people who do pragmatic or want to do pragmatic trials. Uh, so trying to mix those things up uh, together is part of the objective that I have today. Um, there's a list there. This is my CME hat that has everybody's disclosures, but I included my disclosure slide, so here they are for you, and you can decide whether or not there are any conflicts. Um, what I'm going to do over the next hour or so, and by the way, I welcome questions as we go along, because when things sort of come up, I'd, I'd like to clarify. Um, and if you have something to add, I really love interactive discussions rather than a one-way street. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about the setting where we conduct our trials because although many of us are from the area, um, it's, it's uh, surprising how few people really know about uh, the situation in the Alabama Black Belt. I, I'd like to tell you about the ENCOURAGE trial so you really understand what the methods are that I'm going to be sharing with you. And then I'd like to share some strategies um, or lessons about recruitment. Uh, that I think directly inform large pragmatic trials or small pragmatic trials, uh, depending on the funding agency, right, Jeff? Um, the unit of randomization, which can be a, a sticky issue and certainly was for us. Some novel time-related factors that I have not seen um, in community-based trials, uh, but that are some things that people should be aware of and think about. We had some solutions to these issues, and I'd love input whether you think they were valid and um, some sort of overarching uh, lessons from community engagement and community engaged research that I think are very relevant. So let's start off with the setting. Um, as all of you, I'm sure, know, the southeastern United States is not very good for your health. It has the highest stroke and coronary heart disease mortality in the country, the highest burden of diabetes, the highest burden of obesity, and these problems come into sharper focus in the rural areas. Most of you know that uh, rural populations are part of the AHRQ disparities report as a specific vulnerable population. Um, and the reasons for that are very clear. Uh, many of our rural populations, and certainly Alabama is no exception, uh, have very high poverty rates, 30% uh, or more in some of the black communities. And really the biggest problem, despite all of these um, sort of, okay, so how am I going to do this? There we go. Uh, the, the, the needs, um, the resources that are available are very scarce. So um, by way of example, uh, when we started the ENCOURAGE trial, there were two certified diabetes educators for an eight-county area. Um, that's not a lot of diabetes education. Booker T. Washington described the Black Belt, which runs from Texas, actually uh, right over here, through Louisiana, um, up uh, all the way to uh, southern Virginia, as a term that was first used to designate a part of the country which was distinguished by the color of the thick, dark, and naturally rich soil, which was, of course, the part of the South where the slaves were most profitable. And consequently, they were taken there in the largest numbers. Later, and especially since the Civil War, the term seems to be used wholly in a political sense, that is, to designate the counties where the black people outnumber the white. Now, I came from New Jersey when I moved to Alabama. I didn't really know very much about the state, but I had never heard of the Black Belt. And um, what, what has become very clear to me is that people in the Black Belt actually like the name and are very proud of it. People outside the Black Belt are made very uncomfortable by it. Um, so that's an interesting conundrum. I like to go with uh, what people who live there feel. Um, so we use it all the time, but it does raise some eyebrows and make some people a little bit uncomfortable. So that green circle shows you where Alabama is, and if you blow that up with the black belt going across the south central part of the state is what we used for our logo. 
It helps to have a graphic artist as your um, project coordinator, by the way. I highly recommend that. All of this beautiful work is from her. Uh, so here is part of the reality. So Birmingham right here in the middle, and this is I-20. Um, here is the eight county area where we work. This is approximately one and a half hours, and to try to get in here is approximately two and a half hours one way. So this is not possible without having community um, members with boots on the ground. And our community-based teams are uh, consisting of a community coordinator, sometimes with an assistant, the peer supporters, who I'll tell you more about, interviewers, and recruiters, all of which are community members. So we had a Western Black Belt team, a Central Black Belt team, and a Southern Black Belt team. So that's a lot of people out in the community. Um, this slide is intended to show you the realities of uh, rural Alabama medicine, and this is specific to the Black Belt. So we have our Black Belt counties in the top row, Alabama um, in the next row, and then the United States uh, below. And I'm sorry for the percent black in the United States. I don't know where that came from. It's actually 16 percent. So you can see in the eight Black Belt counties where we are, um, there it's a predominantly black community or a series of communities. Um, poverty is rampant, 32 percent, and this was, I think, before um, the, the recent, uh, as it's now being called, the Great Recession. <laughs> the term seems to be catching some traction. So um, there's, there's just a, a, a paper in this uh, month's JGIM that shows the, um, the greater impact on minorities of this recession. It has been enormous. So these numbers are probably even worse now than they were um, at, the, at this time. Uh, you can see the prevalence of diabetes, and if you put uh, erase diabetes and put obesity, it looks very similar. And, and here is really the heart of the problem. So nationally, we have, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, about 2025 uh, primary care physicians per 10,000. Um, Alabama is a little bit behind that, but you can see it's almost an order of magnitude lower in the areas where we have the greatest need. So this is um, a very large problem because this is not an area where there's any health system. Uh, the, these are, by and large, solo practices in the big metropolitan areas of Selma and Demopolis, which are not metropolitan areas at all. Um, they're essentially large towns. You do have some group practices where you might get three or four doctors practicing together, but they don't have a health system. And this, this is a really enormous challenge when you have some of the great stuff that we heard from Dr. Auerbach, wherever he is, there he is. Uh, a lot of that um, sort of cutting edge technology um, is not really uh, a realistic option. Uh, to make matters even more cha challenging in Alabama specifically, we have the Tuskegee legacy. And you may be aware that um, we like in Alabama to say thank God for Mississippi. Um, Alabama consistently ranks in the bottom five states in terms of the quality of our public education system. But it's very hard to find a resident of the Black Belt who does not know about the Tuskegee syphilis study. This, just to remind you, was a study that was conducted between 1932 and 1972. Uh, it was um, designed to describe the natural progression of untreated syphilis, and the participants were unbeknownst to them. Uh, they were uh, poor, rural-dwelling black men who thought they were receiving free health care, which they did, but they were also um, being observed for this natural history. They never told they had syphilis. They were never treated, despite the fact that penicillin was shown to be effective in the 1940s. And the legacy is a deep-seated mistrust of the health system and uh, in general, and medical research in particular. So trying to do studies with uh, members of, this com of these communities um, has added challenges. And I think the other piece, which is really important for the Tuskegee legacy, is the interaction between patients and physicians. Um, and this, this comes out in, in amazing ways. There's somebody here at the School of Public Health who's done some very interesting work um, specifically addressing the Tuskegee legacy, and the urban legends about syphilis are just spectacular. Um, but that's a tangent, uh, not for today's discussion. So I, to just bring into focus what these people are trying to do, you have diabetes, you're supposed to eat healthy, you're supposed to exercise, um, and this is where most of us live in the United States, and this is what people in the Black Belt have to deal with. So 
Um, obviously, population density is, is very sparse. The distance to the nearest supermarket is at least an hour for the great majority of people. And the reality is that a lot of people do their grocery shopping at dollar stores. So if you haven't been to a dollar store recently, the next time you pop in there, try to imagine yourself doing grocery shopping, especially trying to look for healthy foods in a dollar store. It is very challenging. Um, the distance to the doctor is very similar. Some people routinely come up here two and a half hours one way. You can imagine how often that happens. Um, the American Diabetes Association recommends that um, people see their diabetes doctor four times a year. On average in the black belt, it's somewhere less than two. Social networks are very tight. Um, and this is a very important aspect of these communities that I think we can leverage. Um, family units tend to be nuclear, uh, familiar to us in suburban and urban USA, but they are very commonly extended families in the black belt. And cell phone coverage and internet um, really very sparse, uh, intermittent, and unreliable. So some of the wonderful technologies that we are seeing solutions for chronic disease management, not so much for these folks. Oops, what did I do? Help. OK, good. Hooray. <laughs> At least there's a little button down here. I've been told not to press. It's going to explode the entire building. So we'll see whether or not I manage to do that. Um, so the, it, added to that is um, who are the doctors who practice in the black belt? So you can see here the Marion Health Center, which is in Perry County. And at the bottom, I have um, a, a picture of a porch roof. Uh, there's a lot of local folklore, which is very, very interesting. If you're an anthropologist, go down, have at it. It's really very interesting. So Haint Blue is um, a special, Haint has a very interesting uh, derivative. It is an African word originally. And um, you can see the blue on the ceiling. The idea here is, and by the way, this is a worldwide uh, folklore. Um, it's not just in Africa. Uh, you can find it in pockets all over the world don't really know very much about that, but the idea is that blue uh, represents water, haints are ghosts, and ghosts can't pass over water, so you need to put some blue on your house in order to protect yourself. So that is just one example of some of the folklore, and uh, what you have is a surprising number of Indian physicians from this Indian subcontinent, um, because they're doing payback for um, National Health Service Corps because they had tuition paid for for school. So you can imagine somebody who comes not only from a different culture, but from a different country across the world now comes into these communities. And um, we need to have good physician-patient communication and um, concordance and all of that stuff. Well, that's very good for theoretical um, uh, goals, but the reality is you have to take what you can get. Um, I actually like Dr. Akhtar a lot. I think he's a great guy. He's been there for 20 years. So this is kind of what the National Health Service Corps wants. Um, he went there for his four-year stint, but then he stayed. Um, so this is not all bad. It's just um, additional barriers. Uh, it's very hard to get people to practice in the black belt. So this is our southern team. Uh, Wilcox County has two physicians. Uh, one of them is the right-hand gal who is Sister Cook. She practices here at the um, Pineapple Health Center. And what you find when you get to know doctors in the black belt is they all have some sort of calling. It's very unusual to find somebody who happens to be a native, went to medical school, and came back. The great majority of people would prefer not to practice in a town that has this for its town hall. Um, culture is very sparse, as I mentioned, the internet connection. So the Sisters of St. Joseph's are terrific, um, but they are elderly. So this is a picture that was taken 10 years ago, and Sister Cook is now 72, and there isn't a successor. So um, this is a real problem. The Western Black Belt, um, this is a, a good luck story. So you can see some of the beautiful mansions that just await someone to come and uh, restore them. Uh, but this is Deborah Cook, who is our community coordinator in, in the Western Black Belt, and this is her husband, who has diabetes. They make no secret about that, being sworn in as the sheriff. So we had no idea that was going to happen, but she is a woman of some stature in her community, and that has benefited us and our studies tremendously. So if you can find the wife of the sheriff, or better yet, the sheriff himself, <laughs> very helpful. So um, peer support. This is... Uh, what I think is, is the potential solution for communities like this. Um, peer support 
community health workers, promotoras, they have a variety of names. But essentially, um, the, the idea is that these are people from the community. These are not healthcare professionals. Um, they are sort of like involved, engaged moms is a good way to think about them. Uh, the literature is growing on their effectiveness. Um, they, there's a very large group of people, I don't see Mona here, but there's the, the Cancer Center here has done some remarkable work to show that you can reduce disparities for cancer, for cancer screening, for completion of cancer uh, uh, protocols. Um, but for chronic disease management, the, the liter literature is, is a little bit sparser and it is emerging. A pretty definitive evidence in HIV, asthma, emerging evidence in diabetes. But Andrea Charrington um, wrote a very nice uh, sort of summarization of the literature to propose that for some chronic disease management like diabetes, an unanswered question is whether peer support is actually superior to education alone. So we already talked about the general education level in, in Alabama. Um, diabetes specific education is even less. So the, the question really does come up that is it worth the expenditure of training peer supporters and having a community-based infrastructure or should all we be doing is just going out there and trying to do diabetes education? So for very underserved communities, this is actually a very important question. So that is the birth of the ENCOURAGE trial. So the central question that we uh, sought to answer was whether education plus volunteer peer coaching was more effective in improving diabetes outcomes than education alone. This was a group randomized or cluster randomized trial. Uh, our target participant uh, recruitment was 400. We trained 30, uh, we were aiming to train between 30 and 35 peer advisors. We actually trained 60 and uh, we had three community coordinators. Uh, the outcomes of the trial were A1C, blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, and body mass index. Um, the control condition was a one-hour diabetes education class. So um, if you're familiar at all with uh, diabetes, one hour of diabetes education is about um, one-eighth of what is recommended by the American Diabetes Association and the Association of uh, Diabetes Educators. So we really distilled it down. Um, it's very hard to do an eight-hour curriculum in one hour. Uh, so this was an iterative process, and I have to acknowledge our nursing partners um, they did a terrific job of figuring out what it is that they were going to say in an hour. Not surprisingly, food was a major emphasis. Um, people got a report card. Um, I'll show you a copy of that very quickly. Uh, cookbook, again, beautiful materials, placemat with uh, very simple dietary messages, the plate that Michelle Obama is emphasizing, which I think is a great approach. Um, and in the black belt, I didn't show you this picture, but um, it's, it, you know, to, church socials, uh, churches are, are a central um, part of social life. And when people go to church socials, they go to a banquet table, which is heaped with food. And it's very common for them to have these heaping platefuls, and not just one, but two and sometimes even three. So portion size control is a really simple, nice message. So you don't have to be complex with carbohydrate exchange systems. First, we're just going to work on one portion only, um, and that really gets you three quarters of the way around the track. Uh, they got this exercise video as well, and on top of all of that, uh, the intervention folks uh, worked with a peer coach for 10 months or more. Uh, we had planned to do baseline and 12-month follow-up data, and that gives you an idea of the trial. The intervention um, was delivered by volunteer peer advisors. The volunteer status was something that was um, mandated by our funding agency, Peers for Progress, the American Academy of Family Physicians, uh, partnering with the Eli Lilly Foundation. Uh, they really wanted to look at volunteers. Uh, that's actually a very contentious issue among the um, investigators because I think you can ask volunteers to do episodic things. I think it's much more invasive to do chronic disease self-management. I mean, that's a daily thing. And they're on the phone every week. And it really is, is asking people to make a tremendous commitment. So we all cheated in some way or another and found ways to reimburse them because we felt like, it, you know, it's not just being nice to volunteers. You actually need to make demands of people to get intervention fidelity. And you can't make demands of volunteers. All you can do for volunteers is say thank you very much. Um, so it, it really is an issue. 
Uh, so um, they had contacts. They, they had to either have diabetes themselves. Actually, most of our peer supporters did not have diabetes. But if they didn't have it, they had to have taken care of a friend or family member um, in their day-to-day -day diabetes self-care. So they had to have a lot of familiarity with what that is all about. Uh, the contacts were an initial get-to-know-you face-to-face meeting, weekly telephone conversations for the following 8 to 12 weeks, which was our inter, uh, intensive intervention phase. This is very much modeled on lifestyle behavioral interventions. And then a sort of a maintenance phase of monthly telephone contacts um, for a total of at least 10 months, but we told them they could keep going if they wanted to. Um, I think we collect the last data were collected now going on two years ago, and some of them are still in touch with their clients. Um, th we also added in a call before and after the healthcare provider visit um, with a little program to try to improve the quality of that. And um, we use that little AHRQ. I don't know if you've seen it. There's this one minute video, which is terrific, of this young woman who's at a restaurant and th she's asking all these questions of the waiter about the menu. And then she gets to the doctor's office and she's sitting on the exam table and the doctor says, Any questions? And she's sort of like totally quiet. Um, really tells the story very well. Uh, very important is the participant driven nature of this intervention. So people got their one hour education session with sort of sound bite education, if you will. Then they took a look at their report card. And then right after that, they sat down with their peer supporter to try to decide what they wanted to work on. And actually, it was very interesting what they decided to work on. I'll tell you that in a second. Here's a copy of the report card. Um, again, my graphic artist. So the people got there that day. We had point of service A1C blood pressure, obviously collected with very rigorous standards. Uh, LDL cholesterol and then weight. Um, this is a little bit controversial. People are epidemiologists in the room. So we know that BMI, although it's in all of the guidelines and it's something that we need to work on, for blacks specifically, the BMI categories, um, really not that clear about the relationship, especially between BMI and cardiovascular disease outcomes. Um, it, it is, nevertheless, as you'll see from our sample characteristics, we're, we're talking on the morbidly obese end of the scale. Um, the, the mean BMI was, was I think, over uh, 30. So um, these people definitely need to lose weight. So this was sort of simplified. We did not spend a lot of time on this report card because they just came out of education. So they learned what these numbers meant. Then they looked at their own numbers. So again, the, the report card counseling was maybe a minute. Um, the training for the peers was rudimentary. Um, two Saturdays, it was conducted in the Black Belt in restaurants so that we could use local foods to model food choices. We always had a buffet table, taught them about the plate and right size portions, and half the plate should be vegetables, and then they had to go and put that into action, which they loved, exercising together with the video. So it was really a fun experience. A lot of emphasis on motivational interviewing skills, practice, practice, practice and a little bit of the protocol. So that was essentially the training with the certification at the end. So that gives you sort of an overview of the setting as well as of the trial. So now let's talk about some of the methodologic challenges and the way we overcame them. So when we went into this, um, we made a very difficult decision to focus on uh, individuals who had primary care physicians. So. I just described the setting to you, a lot of people don't have doctors, but we felt that it was substantively different um, if we included people who didn't have access to care, all the attention would be on getting them access to care and there wouldn't really be a lot of energy left over um, to try to focus on disease self-management. Um, as you probably know, we do not have a very generous approach to our poor in this state, so trying to get people into care is a really huge challenge. Um, people with diabetes, diabetes alone certainly does not make you eligible for Medicaid. Uh, I mean, for Medicaid, yeah, Medicaid, sorry. Um, the only hope you would have is to try to get on disability, and that's a big, long, drawn out process. So um, we just decided that we were going to focus on the people who somehow had, uh, had care. So we um, looked at our map and located 12 primary care practices that sort of um, spanned our, our target areas. Uh, we initially sent a letter to um, the physician or the community coordinators already had a personal relationship and contacted them about interest and those that were interested um, had a follow-up telephone call with me and the um, and the project manager 
Uh, and if they continued to express interest, we had a follow-up lunch meeting, lots of road trips down to the Black Belt in year number one of the study, at which point we briefed the entire staff about the study um, and uh, identified a practice champion that the physician had thought about who would be the right person for that. Um, talk a little bit about the recruitment plans, so how should they be adapted to your practice and lots of opportunity for questions. So uniformly, these 12 practices were wildly enthusiastic about this program because diabetes uh, control is, as you might imagine, not terrific. Um, so they had no doubts they were going to be able to send us hundreds of patients in a matter of a month or two. Well, that is not what happened. And I think this is where the cautionary tale for pragmatic clinical trials uh, comes about. Do not rely on clinic staff or physicians for recruitment, bottom line. It uh, doesn't matter how um, enthusiastic they are. They want to help you. This 16% over here that came from the clinic staff was one nurse practitioner. She, she did three quarters of those patients because she was very engaged, and nurses can follow protocols and remember to do things. Doctors can't. Simple as that. They want to, but it just is, not, is beyond them. So um, after two months of recruitment with way below target accruals, we sat down with our community-based teams and we switched over to respondent-driven sampling. And what that involves is basically your entire community-based team, community coordinators, peers, and some of the participants that you've already gotten in, in the trial, where you basically tell them, get the word out. We have the study. Anyone with diabetes, we gave them a little flyer. And um, for every participant that was referred by somebody, we kept track of that, the, the referral person, if the person enrolled in the study, got $5. So that was an extraordinarily effective um, uh, approach. You can see that more than half of our uh, eventual study participants came from that strategy. And um, I just want to draw your attention to this number. Remember, I told you we had a 400 target. We actually had to shut down recruitment at 424. We could have kept going. This is in the Black Belt with the Tuskegee legacy and all that. So you get community members involved in a program that they want. They've been desperate for diabetes programs. You can do this. You can recruit people into a randomized trial. It is definitely possible. So that's, that's my caution for, for people with pragmatic trial aims. Don't rely on the clinic staff. You've got to figure it out. Hey, the, the IRB issues here are enormous. So many of the clinics, when we, want, when we were... were slow on recruitment, wanted to give us lists of their patients with high A1C. There was one clinic that had an EMR, and they could generate a list of who had their last uh, hemoglobin A1C and who was uncontrolled. They knew all their patients very, very well. The IRB said absolutely not. You have to have permission from the patient in order to be contacted. So that was the big stumbling block, is we had to have signed interest cards. So, you know, the, the community coordinators would go back to the practices, and there was a box and posters about the study, and we had had the lunch to in-service everybody. Two weeks later, they came back. People had forgotten all about it. They'd thrown the boxes away. They didn't know what an interest card was anymore. I mean, it was a disaster. So it, it, was, it was very, very difficult and cumbersome, whereas if you had one-on-one -on -one contact in the community with respondent-driven sampling, it was a, a lot more effective. Okay. So... Our change in uh, recruitment strategy impacted greatly our unit of randomization. So this is one of these cluster randomized trials where you need to account for clustering because patients are clustered within clinics. Um, but the intervention actually acts at the patient level. So it's appropriate to adjust for clustering but analyze at the patient level. This used to be controversial. Thank heavens it's no longer controversial. Um, and we figured patients attend clinics, so patients are nested within clinics. Uh, there are very long waits. Dr. Willie White, who's black, is right next to Dr. Raymond Blackman, who's white, no lie. Um, he, Willie White sees up to 100 patients during flu season, a day. So you can imagine the waits in his office. Um, community members know each other, they talk, so we really had some concerns about potential contamination. Uh, so we figured this was a good unit of randomization. Well, <laughs> the reality was that we really missed the boat on this tremendously. So not only did we have to 
account for people who did not attend one of the 12 clinics, we also found that it was very common for members of the same family to attend different clinics. So the potential for contamination within a family obviously is much, much higher than in the waiting room of a place that you only go twice a year anyway. Um, so community members definitely talk a lot. And it ended up that the better unit of randomization should be the community. Um, and as it turned out, because of the way that we selected our practices, it became very easy to sort of change from uh, clinic as the unit of randomization to community as a unit of randomization. So we were very lucky because that actually was not necessarily um, the way it would work out. So if you look at the um, interclass correlation coefficient, just briefly, this is a reflection of the amount of variation that is at your cluster level. Uh, we usually start worrying when the ICC is much over 0 0.015. Um, so you can see there's a, there's a significant, or I shouldn't say significant, substantial ICC, because um, Joshua Richmond, who couldn't be here today, actually put lower, uh, lower and upper confidence bounds. And you can see they cross zero. So technically, um, it may not be a significant ICC, but it's pretty close. So you're out there at the thousands point. So uh, it, it, we definitely accounted for clustering in our analysis. Um, but the unit of randomization is when you're in the community like this, this is not a trivial is issue. So the, the trial that we're fielding right now, we did a nice block randomization scheme by the size of the town and so forth. So, so I feel a lot more confident that we, we got it this time around. OK. So let's move on to some seasonal issues. This is a very interesting issue that I have not seen anybody write about in uh, pragmatic trials or in uh, clinical trials. This is in the epidemiology literature, but the two have not sort of communicated. So let me just show you what the impact of seasonal variations in some of the outcome measures are. So this is a paper that we wrote and published back in 2005 um, from the VA. We have about 800,000 people with diabetes. And what we did here, or actually Chin Ling did, was um, these are the months on the x-axis over two years. Over here has two y-axes. One is the um, mean monthly hemoglobin A1C level. And over here is um, the percent of individuals who were assessed to be above 9, which was the VA performance measure at that time. So this, this is one of these beautiful graphs that tells a lot of different stories. So the first thing that you notice is that over time, there's this lovely sinusoidal pattern to A1C. And um, this is all accounting for autocorrelation, blee, 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 blah, 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 nice little methods piece. If you're interested, you can read that. But the bottom line is, if you want to have a successful trial, here's how you do it. You recruit all your intervention patients in the winter. You have a six-month trial, and you do your follow-up measures in the summer. You recruit all your control patients in the summer, and then you do your six-month follow-up the next winter. Guaranteed success. Nobody accounts for this in their studies. And there are lots of studies in, in hemoglobin A1C where you see an intervention effect of 0.3, and the control group got worse of 0.3, which, by the way, adds up to 0.6. And the peak-to-peak -peak variation here is darn close to 0.4. So it goes from about 8.1 down to not quite 7.7. .7. And um, for those of you who are not diabetes uh, folks, um, 0.4 is usually the difference that you power your study on because it's considered to be a clinically important change. So this is a big issue to me, but nobody else really has paid attention to it. Um, parenthetically, uh, this also has enormous impact for quality assessment. So that's what this x uh, y-axis over here shows you. So um, you don't want to be high. This is your proportion of your diabetes patients who are uncontrolled. So you want to be down here. So you can see if you can sort of game the system and do all of your measurement in the summer, that's guaranteed to get you pretty low. And as usually happens with threshold measures, um, they really augment the, the effects. So you can actually, the same population, uh, you could be as low as 13% uh, you know, or as bad as over 20%. 
And that makes a huge difference. Um, a lot of quality measures that are at the hospital level don't have this much variation. That's one of the problems that people don't talk about. Um, you can be number 99, and, and the, the person who's number one is just a little bit ahead of you in terms of the absolute value. So this is a huge amount of variation. Last, I think importantly, and this was one of the major reasons why we wrote this paper, uh, Len Pogash, where is he? He's right there, was the diabetes director for the VA at the time. And if you were going to draw a line through this, it has a nice negative slope, which means that overall A1C was getting better in the VA. So he didn't care so much about the epidemiology and the sinusoidal. He cared more about the fact that things were improving. Okay, that's very interesting. Why am I showing you this slide? Well, uh, here is the ENCOURAGE study baseline. Um, and you can see, first of all, you know, you're going to tell me, okay, none of these numbers are different. But um, if, if anybody knows me, they know that I've gone on a rampage about dichotomous approaches to interpretation of data. And I think the p-value of 0.05 is one of the biggest problems that we have in modern epidemiology and quality of care studies. Because what you want to do is look at the pattern. And what you see here is definitely a hint of a sinusoidal shape. Now, this is not statistically significant. The variation is wide. Remember, I showed you it was 0.35 or so for peak-to-peak -peak variation. And if you look at these means, um, this is uh, 8 and 10. So the variations here are huge. Um, but you see the effect is there. So this is not just a quirk of the VA. This is a real deal. Uh, so adjusting for season of the year was obviously one of the things we wanted to, uh, to look at. So you might say, well, geez, you know, you're going to uh, recruit all your patients over, uh, you know, just a three-month period. And then you're going to do follow-up and uh, follow-up measures over a three-month period. And if you do that, you probably don't need to adjust for season. But here is another reality of doing community-based research, uh, data collection. So in our case, uh, data collection was a production. So we, I had this amazing team that agreed to give up their Saturdays, get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, meet out in front of medical towers at 5, drive down two and a half hours to do data collection. And this is typically how it went. Um, we had our university staff. Uh, that went to various community sites, businesses, churches. All the churches opened up their doors. Nobody charged us anything. We had a couple of charges for community venues. Um, but uh, the university staff fit into a 12-passenger van and uh, partnered with community members who helped us in several stages. So people would... Oops, back. There we go. People would help us, uh, would, would arrive. They'd been pre-screened on the phone. So they said, yes, we're coming. We, we want the study. Uh, would do their informed consent, written informed consent, then they would get their biometrics, so we had a nurse from the community. Our supervisor was right there, so we could supervise. Um, we had trained community interviewers because we wanted to do face-to-face -face interview, and this, this was a big issue because we had things like trust in physicians, discrimination scales, so we really wanted to get disclosure, and we thought that, and the community coordinators suggested to us that if there were community members uh, who were doing the interviews, it would reassure people and it would just be familiar and enhance uh, or facilitate disclosure. So we had these interview stations and our uh, university-based interview supervisor was constantly sort of walking back and forth listening in and was able to make reinforcement uh, corrections as needed. Of course, all of these people were trained, certified, um, lots and lots of quality assurance ahead of time and then quality control once the program is up and running. Once they got finished with their interviews, about 45-minute interview, um, we had this sort of rotating station of the diabetes education. There were four major areas, and they basically, as you come out of here, you could go to any of these stations that were open, and then you just sort of went around the circle and came back out, got your report card, which was from the biometrics, went to lunch, and then if you were intervention, uh, you met your peer supporter. So you can imagine this is not something that you can just do at the snap of a finger on a daily basis. It requires a lot of planning. So what is the impact on data collection? Well, we wanted to do baseline a 12-month. You're in the real world. These are real-world patients, and they have real-world problems. So uh, you have a clinical trial. It's over at the hospital. You have a very select patient population that's highly committed, and they're going to show up and they're going to do what you tell them to do. That is not the case in the real world. These people have other things to do besides come and, and uh, participate in your study. 
So they say they're coming, and then there's a funeral. This was the number one reason why people did not attend as they were supposed to. The, the entire community goes out for every funeral. And since this is the highest uh, stroke and, and uh, CHD mortality area, there are a lot of funerals. Um, some people forget. Uh, you know, we, we tried really hard to contact people on the telephone. Anybody who works in an indigent community can tell you telephone contact is, is very challenging. A lot of people can't afford telephones. So what they do is they get prepaid plans that have a certain number of minutes. If you run out before the end of the month, you have several days and sometimes a couple of weeks with no telephone contact. So forgetting was an issue. Um, when we did get to people, most of them, uh, to remind them, would come. We also had a transportation issue. You know, gas, this was when gas was going through the roof and very indigent uh, population, people lived far away. So we actually had a van that could pick people up and, and we did that as well. Um, and then sometimes they were just busy. They had other things that they needed to do. So everybody didn't show up. Um, so what was the impact on data collection? Well, our three month data collection period, I already told you about our woes uh, with accrual um, for recruitment. Uh, ended up going out to seven months, much longer than we anticipated, and it spans the winter and the summer, as I told you, with the seasonal effects, so this becomes an issue. And what you can see here is the intervention is in dark blue and the control is in light blue. There's differential accrual across treatment arms. So now you begin to get into that nice, messy, real-world problem of how to uh, tease that apart. So you think that's bad, wait till you see what happened at follow-up. So the first time around they were on their best behavior, the second time around, ah, this 45 minute interview, this is so boring, I don't really want to do it, there's no education class at follow-up. It was a lot harder to get people to come back. Um, we actually uh, at, at some point switched over to in-home data collection modeled on the REGARD study. Uh, because uh, we, I was bound and determined to get at least an 80% follow-up rate, but the sacrifice was an extraordinarily prolonged uh, data collection period where the goal was 365 days, which is right over here, and you can see we would have less than 70 people at that point. The mean was actually 431, and the median was 419, but you can see this enormously long tail, which, by the way, keeps going. This We just cut it off to show you, get the, the idea. Uh, so now you not only have prolonged data collection, you also have a very different effect between baseline and follow-up. So that is a moving target. You no longer have anything that's approximately a year. I mean, there's, this is uh, one and a half years right out here. So if you just take an average, a uh, group average, you are really not doing yourself uh, a service and you're not accurately reflecting what actually happened. So you can imagine in a behavioral intervention that there's going to be uh, differences if people are measured a year and a half later versus a year later. Um, again, not things that people tend to talk about in their papers. So um, Joshua Richman is a wonderful uh, mathematician slash MD um, who came up with the solutions to these problems. So obviously clustering with mixed models is pretty standard. Uh, there's a little bit of imbalance across treatment arms. Again, that's nothing uh, unusual. But we added in variables for the time of year of data collection in sort of three-month blocks and the days between baseline and follow-up. And I'm going to show you what that translates into and why it's very important. But before I do that, let me just show you our population. So we have 360 people who completed uh, the, the follow-up. That was out of 424 initially, so this was an 80 percent retention rate, which is really wonderful. I, I, I feel very proud, and my staff is to be thanked for that. Yes, exactly. Clustering, accounting for clustering. Um, so a little bit of imbalance on, uh, well, definitely some imbalance across uh, on race. A hint of imbalance on education and income. And the main difference here was that we had a, a smattering of people in the control group who had um, more than high school education and more than $30,000 of income. Um, but what I would call your attention to is that about 75% of these people, uh, two thirds to three quarters, had incomes below $30,000. Uh, dollars. And you can see the very high burden of insulin use nationally, that's quite a bit lower. So here is the impact 
of the prolonged data collection um, at follow-up. Let me just walk you through the slide because it's a little bit unusual. What we have at the bottom is the month between baseline and follow-up. So that should be 12, but you can see that is varies tremendously. And we have in red the values of the control arm participants at these various time points, and in blue, the intervention uh, participants. And over here, we have A1C, and zero means you didn't change. This, these are change in A1C from baseline, so if you got something on the zero, these little dots over here, it means that you were exactly the same at baseline and follow-up. And what you can see here is that there seems to be a hint, and this is the, the, line, the zero line, that later on uh, we got people who had more improvement than early on. So the people that we happened to collect uh, early, close to the 12-month time period, were different than the people who we collected later on. And that's, that's sort of not what you want. Um, you, again, sort of get the hint that there's something sinusoidal going on. These confidence bands overlap, but in both cases, both intervention and control, the later data collection people were different from the early data collection uh, people. So this is the kind of pattern that makes you very nervous if you're just going to schmear all these together and say these are all our follow-up values. No, we looked at that. The, the people from the clinics were no different um, than the people that we got from uh, respondent-driven sampling. So that was, that was really not an issue. Um, you know, it's, there, there are too few people out here. You can see how sparsely uh, these numbers, most of our follow-up occurred over here, um, and these, these are sort of the stragglers. But this sort of gives you an idea of what's going on here with the average. Um, the LDL change, again, uh, later on for both intervention and control, although for in intervention it's not really as much of a problem because the confidence bands sort of stick, the, the zero line is within them, but certainly for the controls, uh, later on, the people that we had, uh, their LDL was worse than the people that we measured early on in follow-up. Um, the story for BMI looks a little bit better, but is actually uh, not. Um, this is the worst scenario. Uh, this is where we have for, if, if all of the numbers of the curves look like this, we would be in great shape because there's no difference between the people that you get early versus the people that you get late. But this is the problem. So you've got, for control, it doesn't really matter when you measured them. They all didn't change. But for intervention, the ones that you got later, the confidence band was, was well below uh, below zero. So um, this, this is uh, the kind of situation where you really want to account for this. So let me tell you, let me just show you what the impact is on the interpretation of the trial results. So what? Well, I mean, obviously the people that were further out were the ones that didn't come for follow-up until we knocked on their door and got the information when we got in. Except that they had better numbers in many cases. So, I mean, it's not consistent. It's not like all the numbers were worse later on. In some cases, the numbers were better later on. So it, it, is, it is a little bit um, puzzling. Uh, but, in, you know, in the black belt, I think one of the things that uh, really comes out is people are very polite. So um, when they don't want to come, they don't say no. They always say they're going to come, and that's part of the reason why this was so prolonged. If they had just said, look, I'm not coming, it would have been finished. We would have had a bad follow-up rate, a retention rate. But you know, when you knocked on their door, they did agree. Um, so coming out and for the data collection, I think, was a major barrier. That's a possibility. They wanted, because I think there is this, we want to please the doctor. Uh, there's definitely some of that going on. And lifestyle, lifestyle change <coughs> is not easy. Maybe it does take 20 minutes. It's, it's possible. It is possible. Um, so, so let me just show you what the impact is from a methodologic perspective. 
um, if you did the trial sort of the way that people do it standard versus taking into account all of these time-related factors. So here is our baseline value for the main study outcomes for the intervention group, and here are the values for the control group. You can see there are some modest differences, but they're really not striking. Um, the changes are very modest, um, and it looks in many cases like there were, uh, for example, for systolic blood pressure, uh, for A1C, a little bit more of a change, although this is very trivial, a uh, little bit more uh, of a benefit over here. And this is just taking those mean values, just smearing everybody together. Um, and uh, very similar for LDL cholesterol, both trial arms got worse. And uh, modest improvements in, in BMI with an appearance of more improvement uh, in, the, uh, in, the inter in the control arm. Just take note of this mean BMI. 36, it's very close. The mean BMI is very close to morbidly obese. Uh, so if we look at the impact of time on the results, so this is the CI uh, change difference. So this is the change for the control group minus the change for the intervention group. So if you have more of a change for the control group, you're going to get a positive number. And if you have more of a change for the intervention group, you're going to get a negative number. And that's what you want. So you want negative numbers. So this is a negative trial, right? All these numbers are positive. So if you do the group by time interaction in this model that accounts for all of these things, uh, you actually see that there is a significant uh, group by time interaction for BMI. And if you then do the predicted intervention effect at 14 months, so now you're sort of doing an apple versus an apple, you see that we have an effect, a significant effect of the intervention on weight loss. Now this was not a weight loss trial, um, and that is really a very surprising finding, but uh, this is probably why. So remember I told you that um, this was a, a, a participant driven intervention. So this is the sort of the, what the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute wants. Here's your numbers. This is what you're supposed to do. What do you want to work on? Everybody wanted to work on diet and exercise. So what, we didn't design it as a weight loss trial. We didn't intend it as a weight loss trial. It was supposed to be a diabetes self-management trial. 50% of these people had problems with medication adherence. So that's the other problem with self-selection. Um, they tell you, you know, this was the Marisky, which everybody hates, loves to hate. It's how many times do you forget to take your medicine? Are people going to be honest? Well, they, they're honest enough that the scores, the Marisky scores correlate very well in this population, like every other one I've ever seen, uh, with their hemoglobin A1C level. So the people who tell you that they have, uh, they forget their medicines have worse A1Cs. But yet, when you give them the opportunity, they choose not to work on medication adherence. So this, this is really interesting, actually. But they all want to work on diet and exercise. So that is a very powerful message. They really get it. They want to lose weight, and they need help doing it. Um, so this is sort of an amazing uh, outcome of the study. Very briefly, what are the two messages that I think the people who want to do pragmatic trials need to consider? First of all, uh, to really get the engagement of your target audience, one of the, the principles of community-based participatory research is sharing of resources. Notice how I don't call this CBPR. CBPR is a very well-established approach, and it is getting a little bit too rigid for my uh, taste. There's all kinds of things with community advisory boards and governance structure and electing presidents and officers and rules that I don't think really advance the science and advance the objective. And the, matter, the fact of the matter is a lot of times you're responding to an RFA and this whole idea that the community members are the ones who say what the research question is supposed to be is sort of mixing the roles, I think. Um, they wanted a diabetes program, they got a diabetes program. Exactly what the intervention question was is really not as important to them. So um, I think the, uh, the engagement in recruitment is unbelievable. Uh, Respondent-driven sampling is sort of a novel approach. Once you get some people in the trial, tell them to get their friends to come and join. It really works, especially when you pay them this very nominal little amount of money. Um, and uh, the data collection involving community members, I think, was another thing that really helped, not only with disclosure, but also with community members that saw that we were employing other community members. And that's very impressive, and people really respond to that. Uh, the other key thing is, and I can't stress this enough, 
when you're in the community with real people, it has to be a program. So you need to think about what you're going to do with the control arm. You cannot have a usual control arm, a usual care control arm. It just, it, no matter what you do with randomization and explaining RCTs to people, they don't get it. All they understand is they don't get anything. And you have to think about how to address that situation. So in this case, we selected the study question so that we could provide education to people. We actually didn't think it was ethical not to provide education because the, the level of understanding was so low. Um, but I would use as an example Andrea Charrington's RWJ work, where she, with her mentor, Isabel Scarinci, was doing an R01 level trial on um, a pap smear screening in a Latino population, Latina population, hopefully. <clears throat> um, Andrea did a diabetes prevention program on the control arm. So it actually helped Isabel because both, both arms got a very substantive program. Um, in the trial that we have now in the field, it's a cognitive behavior training intervention, so you need to have contacts with people. When you do any kind of CBT intervention, you, you can't just have one arm getting CBT and the other arm getting nothing because contacts themselves, regardless of CBT, have an effect. So we are doing a general health intervention with a curriculum, um, and people like that. So you really have to think about this. Um, because it, it, you can't go back to the same community if you have an RCT where you have usual care as the control arm. If you're interested in a sustained relationship, you have to pay attention to this. Yeah, so that's so actually this was a reverse trial. Yeah, yeah. So there's something out there that that's what the community then wants. And it's 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 also it's very challenging for the investigator because you have to figure out what is an appropriate intervention for the control arm that doesn't compromise the internal validity right, of your study. We've had this problem in, in other studies yeah. where we've done too good of a job in controlling them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so it raises the question, as you say, about something totally disease unrelated. Mm -hmm. Or what about the idea of a delayed intervention? Is that so, acceptable? so if you have a thirty-month intervention, I mean, uh, project period, it's not feasible. Um, if you can talk your your funder into, you know, letting you carry over funds and all that kind of stuff, um, that is another option that a lot of people use. But if you have a one-year trial, that gets a little dicey because, you know, it, it costs something to deliver the intervention after, uh, you know, to the control arm. So um, it, it, there are challenges. That's not necessarily a panacea. Did you have a question? Um, well, I mean, I mean, first of all, kind of just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Zafrik uh, Bal. I'm uh, Director of Public Health in the UK. And it's been extraordinarily privileged listening to you. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, it's just been well worth just coming here just to listen to you. Uh, this uh, this morning, just uh, just a couple of things. I mean, we we actually ran a similar kind of trial. There were similar kind of outcomes, similar kind of groups of patients, but there were kind of differences. Uh, I won't go into that just now. But uh, two things. One is um, clearly you seem to be indicating that the methodology that we're using isn't actually picking up some of the kind of benefits of of these kind of approaches. The me you know the standard methodology is almost working against. You're picking up some 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 real positives there, and um, the two things that we found, uh, which were sort of uh, which were quite uh, sort of extraordinary. One was that um, there were subgroups of people who had extraordinary weight loss mm -hmm. who really benefited in a whole range of ways. Now, although the overall outcomes weren't that different, there were subgroups who really had you know they they you know they lost uh, many many kilos of weight. And the second thing was that uh, we didn't really expect because. Exactly. There were, there were some people right, right down the road. And, uh, Too bad that's a control arm patient. <laughs> although, although our BMI didn't change significantly, what we found was that the mental health increased. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Significant. So there were other things, there were other yes. benefits which we weren't picking up. And mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. the mental health one was really interesting because there are other, other kind of benefits of having a community based approach. Yeah, and the, the peer support thing, I think, is really key. Um, because you spend how many hours in the doctor's office every year and how many hours at home. 
Um, and that's, that's really where it gets tough, Jeff. Do you have a sense uh, in all of the data that you collected, what are the characteristics of the patient that are most likely to benefit? Could you risk stratify them to figure that out? Or even could stratify your randomization based upon sort of how interested in how, how engaged you think they might be yeah. based upon whatever baseline instruments that were given to these people about baseline adherence or any other factor that you thought might be important to Yes. So that's a key aspect, um, and the study size is large enough that you could actually do some of that. So we are, we are in the process of, of doing those analyses right now as we speak. I'm going to take one more question, and then maybe the rest of the questions can go to the panel. So that's a great question, and one of the things that I am really interested in is trying to create an infrastructure that has uh, it, it is a vehicle for dissemination. Um, the Affordable Care Act has a very short and scant, uh, sketchy provision for expansion of community health worker reimbursement uh, that is supposed to come online next year. Um, the, there are traditions in some cultures and some communities, specifically Latinos, uh, for promotoras, um, where it's a natural fit for these people have existed long before health services researchers or community-based participatory researchers got, uh, got going. Um, they, they really have an infrastructure and a societal structure that accommodates that. That is not the case in these communities. But Deborah Clark, who was the sheriff's wife, um, actually has a nonprofit organization which currently is plugged into a lot of the practices in the Western Black Belt. And she does things like apply for medication assistance and um, things outside of diabetes as well. So what we're talking to her about is being the home for community health workers in terms of the administrative home. That's a key problem because low education, all kinds of barriers in the Black Belt, figuring out where people like that should be housed is not a trivial issue. But I think it, it makes more sense in that setting to house them independently rather than tying them to specific practices, because who at the practice knows anything about community health workers? So now you have an expert. Now you have a, a cadre of about 60 people who are trained in peer coaching for chronic disease management. So it, it is it, it entirely possible that we're going to get this together. Um, but it's an entirely grassroots-driven effort, which is not nearly as effective as it could be if it was done from both ends, from the top down. Um, I don't have much hope in this state where we're not doing the Medicaid expansion that the uh, public health uh, people are going to be more than supportive. I don't think there's any resources for it.